Well, is it a lesson for all of us? Don't jump to conclusions too quickly. Sometimes great things, and pretty much always great things, take a while. I stood on this very beach about five or six years ago and talked to you about super tankers, Nikon, and the fact that I always had the confidence that they would turn their super tanker around and get themselves going in absolutely the right direction. And, you know, to this day, I still think about that video and think to myself, why was I so confident? And it's not the fact that I'm questioning my confidence. It's the fact that the DNA, which is within Nikon, has always been there and it always continues to be there. And it was there before 2018, 19, 2020, when people seemed to be worried, but the DNA was there. It was there a hundred years before that, give or take. And it's so easy now in hindsight. And if I hadn't recorded those videos and we couldn't go back and look, and here's the link here, you might go, well, it's easy for Matt to say this in hindsight because we can all see how well they're going. But I did actually say all of this stuff when I think at the time we probably had a Z6, a Z7, a Z5 and a Z50. I think that was probably pretty much all the bodies that were available at that point in time. And I would guess it was probably somewhere between 10 and 15 lenses. In this video, I want to talk about the fact that, yes, in the intervening four or five years after I made that video, Nikon has done exactly what I thought they would do, which is take their time to get it right. And I say this because the rumors are beginning to heat up when it comes to the Z6 III. We've got all, all the lenses, all the basic lenses that everybody could ever want. We have the Z8 and the Z9. We're shooting on the Z9 today with the 50mm 1.2, shooting at 6.3, so you can see this beautiful background. And the ZF, and the ZF has ended up being far more than I think any of us ever thought it could be. And this is what brings credibility to me. And I've talked about this before, I'm gonna talk about it again, that speculating on rumors is essentially the same as forecasting in a business. I've run a business for 34 years, check this video out here. But what we have to do is we have to read the tea leaves. We have to look at the market. We have to look at trends. We have to look at what our technology is, what's available to us. And we mix all of this together to make decisions about the future. And it's not really speculating. It's forecasting. It's forecasting on what you think is most likely to happen. That's how this works. And in the case of business, in the case of Nikon or my business, what we're trying to do is forecast our most successful path forward. And part of forecasting is looking at the information that's in front of you and going, well, how likely is it? Now, this latest round of rumors, this data, which may be true, maybe not, who knows, talks about the fact that the Z63 will be using a 24.5 megapixel updated sensor. Now, I've read in the comments on Nikon rumors that people go, oh, they're using the same sensor yet again. It's not the case. The ZF sensor is not the same sensor as the Z6 sensor. And so when we say it's the same sensor, yes, it's got the same number of pixels. The speed of the RAM on the back, the micro lenses, the color array, and anything they might be able to do to miniaturize what's going on outside of the photo sites and thus be able to actually collect more light per photo site. We just don't know because none of this information is ever made public. But there is so much that can be tweaked outside of the 24.5 megapixels, let alone what an amazing processor like the XP7 is doing computationally. And I believe we can see this with the ZF, that it has extraordinarily fantastic low light performance. And I believe that's due partially 
to what XP7 can do on the fly per frame to improve noise. Is it the same as the Z6? No, there is absolutely no chance from my perspective that it's the same as the Z6. And I don't even think it'll be the same as the ZF. I think it'll be tweaked again. Now there is also potential from my perspective and I, I, you know, I just don't know. And if we look at some of these specs, they're talking about 40 frames per second. I do think there is potential for it to be stacked. Now we know, we know that the Z8 and the Z9 are stacked and they are fantastic. And we know stacked is fast. It's a fast sensor on the Z8 and the Z9. 45 megapixels versus 24 megapixels. It's almost half the data and photo sites are considerably larger, which means if you make the Z6 III stat, potentially it has even better low light performance. It has better dynamic range. And, and if you use the same architecture that the Z8 and the Z9 have on the back for moving data off, then because it's got to move half the data, it could actually be significantly faster. So that is just two points of logic where the Z6 III could be a low light, fantastic dynamic range monster, along with it being fast. And this may well play into the notion of an Olympic camera coming. If this camera is Z8, Z9, ZF level AF, if it's got even better low light performance than the Z8 and the Z9, and potentially it's stacked, and potentially it could be even a faster stacked sensor, well, this makes it absolutely fantastic for sports and wildlife. And the reality is, especially for sport, 24 megapixels is absolutely more than enough. More than enough. And with the superb glass that Nikon has now been providing, you can get every option and everything that you need. Do you want 600 at f4? 400 at 2.8, 800 at 6.3, and then you can throw a teleconverter, for example, on the 400 to 8, which already has a teleconverter, another teleconverter, and you've just got so many options. I can see this. I can see the 24.5 faster than the Z8 and Z9 sensor being very credible, very possible with the technology that we have today. And part of what drives my thinking around the Z6 III being really close to a Z8 and a Z9 from a technology perspective, and the prime differential is the 24 versus the 45. It makes perfect sense to me. 24 versus 45, but it's running really, really fast. Now imagine if this camera comes in at a price that also makes it fantastic for wildlife people as well. So you're getting a super fast camera, 24 megapixels, and now Nikon with their great glass, this would certainly be a fantastic option for wildlife and birding shooters. Now I'm not gonna go through every spec because I think some of them kind of dovetail into each other, but another one that I think is important here is that it has seven stops of in-body image stabilization, but even better than the ZF is what this rumor states. Now the ZF, is very good. Like the Z8 and the Z9, already very good. The ZF a little bit better. And they're suggesting here in this rumor that the Z6 III could be even better again. Now, there is talk, there is talk in these rumored specs about pixel shift. Now, we've seen pixel shift in the ZF. It's logical to me that we will see it in other cameras. Hopefully it can come by firmware in the future. It makes sense that we would see it in the Z6 III if it's in the ZF. Now, one thing that the ZF doesn't do is it doesn't allow you to do pixel shift handheld, which is what an Olympus camera can do. Now, why it's more capable of doing is, is because it has a much, much smaller sensor, which is easier to control. There is much, if you can imagine, if you're moving a larger sensor, the distances that it's moving are larger, than a smaller sensor with the same amount of movement. I hope that made sense. If I had the budget, I'd do an animation for you, but I don't. Is it possible, and this is, a, this is not a rumor in here, is it possible that this IBIS unit is even bigger that we might be starting to get into that sort of territory where you could do say a four frame pixel shift 
and bang, you've got an outcome. Currently the pixel shift on the ZF can do 16 frames, I think it is, or maybe even higher. I think it might be even higher. So not only does it give you more res, but it helps reduce noise as well. If that sort of thing's possible, where you are, maybe you could shoot, you know, f four, four frames might be as much as they think you can get. And you can either choose noise reduction or resolution. I mean, wow. Anyway, that's a speculation on my part, but they do talk about pixel shift and obviously that's gonna work on a tripod. But more IBIS is always, from my perspective, warmly received. I use it in both stills, handheld, low light, low shutters, and video all the time. So I'm really excited. If this is true, it's getting even better because it's already amazing. The rumor also states dual stream AF that's even better than a ZF and a Z8. And I presume that includes Z9. I haven't seen any difference between a Z8 and a Z9. Improved, sure. Again, if you've got XP7 and you've got less pixels, you've got less to work on. For those who are very concerned about best-in-class autofocus, when basically from everybody I've spoken to, the focus of the ZF, Z8 and Z9 is on par with its peers. And at this point, any differences is coming down to user handling and use case and lens choice. But if someone's trying to litigate to you, don't buy a Z8, a ZF or a Z9 because its focus is not as good as a Canon or a Sony. I think the harsh realities of that is real world usage, it's all much the same at this point in time. But any advancements, obviously the world is gonna keep working on AF. That's never gonna stop. It's never gonna stop getting better and smarter. Here we are, we may well, if this rumor is true, we may well get even better autofocus. Amazing. So as I said before, this might be an even faster sensor than the Z8 and the Z9. It might be stacked because it's got half the megapixels. Now the rumor here suggests 40 frames per second. It doesn't talk about RAW, but that's what I'm guessing it means because we can already get more than 40 frames per second on a Z8 and a Z9 full frame in JPEG. So currently we're running at 20 frames per second RAW on a Z8 and a Z9. 40 frames per second would be pretty amazing. And, and look, from my perspective, the use cases that require more than 20 or 30 frames per second in RAW, they start to become very, very small. I think it's the sort of thing that if you wanted to shoot at 60 or 100, 120 or more, you're going to play with it a bit. And then when you get back to your desk and you're going through 120 frames that represents one second, and you're starting to go, it's taking me one hour to choose the definitive moment and really the difference between frame 57 and 75, it, it isn't that much. And you might start to dial it back to say 60 or 30. So I think 40 frames per second in raw, if this rumor is correct, sounds very exciting to me. I have friends shooting sports, Z9s, and they've actually dialed their cameras back to 15 frames per second because it's just enough for the definitive moment. But again, not only have we had the AF wars, we have the frames per second wars. And look, in real terms, for 95 to 99% of us, those wars are over with your A1, your Z8, your Z9, your R3. They all do amazing autofocus. They all have very fast frame rates. Anything much more beyond this really is in the realms of buying a hyper sports car where most people don't even need to buy them. And even some of the people that buy them will hardly ever use them at the 300 kilometers per hour that they do. And so it's a niche within a niche. That's okay. I'm okay for this stuff to keep stepping along because that's technology and that's competition and that's fine. What I'm just merely suggesting here is most of us in real terms practically won't use these things on an ongoing basis. And I'd love to have a conversation in the comments below where do you think the optimal raw frame rate is for you? Is it, or, or not just for you, but for the world around you, your community, where do you think they would go, all right, this is kind of enough to cover most of my needs. Is it 30 frames per second? 
Is it 60? 120? I, I don't think the majority would sit there. You know what? I'm going to put a poll up and ask, what do you think is your optimal maximum frame rates? And there is also talk in this rumor of the camera shooting in, in DX, which if it is 24 megapixels, will be around 10 megapixels shooting, wait for it, 120 frames per second. So it's there, potentially. If the rumor is true, it's there, 120 frames per second, 10 megapixels raw. Again, birds, sports, you might want to do that. Who knows? Now, some rumored video specs that I'm pretty excited about is 6K at 60 frames per second, 12-bit and raw. So again, like is speculated, this really is a cut down Z8, Z9, not having 8K, fantastic. It should be differentiated. It should be less because it will be significantly cheaper. If your Z8 is $3,999 US dollars, then your Z6 III, what is it? Around two and a half, somewhere in that vicinity, and it is giving you reduced specs. I think that's fine. I think that's perfect. Not only do we get 6K 60 frames, but we also get 4K 120 frames per second in raw. This is all really exciting stuff. The rumor also states that the camera will shoot 4K 60 ProRes RAW in HQ. Look, that's really exciting for people that want to shoot in that extraordinarily high-end codec that works super duper well if you're editing on Final Cut Pro, for example. Now, something that's been asked for from people who do more video is shutter angles. And again, if this rumor is correct, it looks like we might be getting shutter angles. To be completely expected, CF Express Type B along with SD. This is the same as what we've seen in the Z8. Obviously, it's the best of all world. You've got this ubiquitous format, this everywhere format, which is SD. And then you've got this robust, extremely large, extremely high speed format, which is CF Express Type B. CF Express Type B has recently been ratified into a version four, which gives us twice the speed. Will new cameras get it? I suppose from my perspective, it makes sense to just have that hardware installed and it's basically future-proofing, time will tell. And this rumor ends with it being USB-C with fast charging. Yep, makes perfect sense, very logical, and it having HDMI Type A. So Type A is absolutely what any videographer wants to see. If you're having an external monitor or an external recorder, you want the largest, most robust format. We've seen it in the Z8 and the Z9. And the way I'm seeing this camera being created is it essentially it is a pared down Z8. It, it's looking like to me it's going to have very similar spec to a Z8, but instead of being 45 megapixels, it's 24. And because it's 24, some things might get faster because all of this seems really plausible to me. Like going back to that forecasting notion that we talked about at the start, all of it seems plausible. That's it, it just all seems plausible. And there's only one question left to me that we just don't know, and that is stacked versus not stacked. But keep in mind that the ZF is not stacked, and how can we differentiate a ZF 24.5 from a Z6 III 24.5, and that would be stacked, or very fast. And as we know, if it's gonna be a slightly cut down Z8, then well, it does have to have the electronic shutter and the sensor shield. That's what I'd like to see. I believe this is a pro camera, not an enthusiast camera. And I believe this is what Nikon is trying to do in this space, is bring us these cameras with these tools. And I see the sensor shield as a tool for photographers. When they're in places like this, it protects them. It's a smart idea, it's a good idea, and of course, a professional tool, you want it to last as long as possible. So not having a mechanical shutter also helps with that. And before we close out this video, circling back to what I talked about five or six years ago, standing on this very beach, Nikon, they have come so far. People counted them out. And why? Because they just simply didn't do what they wanted to do within a pretty small window from my perspective, which might've been something like one or two years long. But what they've come and done from the back of the pack, really the back of the pack, is they brought us with the Z9 and the Z8, two class leading cameras at two class leading price points. And then they brought us the ZF, which everybody thought would just be 
a pumped up ZFC when actually they have brought us the technology of a Z8 and a Z9 in a gorgeous retro package. And this camera seems to be setting not only sales on fire, but also there's plenty of YouTubers out there who are not Nikon users who are picking themselves up a ZF. And this to me is, well, is it a lesson for all of us? Don't jump to conclusions too quickly. Sometimes great things, and pretty much always great things, take a while. I get that, because I've been running my own business for years. I get it. And they've brought to market three products, three cameras, which I think have exceeded all expectations. I don't think that's an exaggeration, along with their firmware strategy that has exceeded everybody everybody's thoughts on what they would do, including mine. I, I had no idea, not only would they bring great hardware, but they've brought this new firmware strategy. And who knows how long they will continue to do this for. But I think it's a good strategy and I think it should stay, personally. But there is no question they are also bringing class leading or class equaling lenses. I would say from a long lens perspective, we're talking about the telephoto lenses, the 400, the 600 and the 800, smaller, lighter lenses, class leading, and with the 400 28 and the 600 F4, both with teleconverters within them, again, class leading. We have lenses like the 85 1.2, the Plenar, class leading. So not only do you have the basics, we've got excellent 24 to 70 two eights and 70 to 200 two eights and 14 to 24 two eights. They're all excellent. But then we have this kind of next level of glass. And can I tell you, I cannot wait to see now as we transition into the exotics, the lenses that we'd love to have, that's what's next. And it's going to be ridiculously exciting. So Nikon took a pause, but they didn't take a pause. That's not what happened. It just looked like they took a pause, but they were pedaling so hard behind the scenes. And now in the last, let's call it two years since the Z9 dropped, absolutely blowing us away every step of the way, I would say since the Z9, astonishing. And here we are, the Z63, I have no reason to believe it also won't be hitting the mark. And that is why these rumored specs that we are forecasting on they look credible to me and they look pretty exciting and not only credible but maybe a little incredible i'm excited by this rumor who knows we're forecasting here this is normal this is the world we're looking at all the data we do know and we're imposing it on top of this speculation this rumor and to me it comes across as highly plausible i'd love to know your thoughts in the comments below and don't forget to vote in the poll. What do you think is the maximum frame rates you really need, real world, when you think about it, after you've taken your camera for a high speed squeeze and then realized I don't need to go through 120 frames per second or 240 frames per second or whatever. Whatever the highest might become, what do you think you might actually realistically use long term? It's been so good to see you. If it's your first time here, I would love to see you again. So please do subscribe, please share and please like. All right, bye for now.